On today's 15 on 15, we'll tell you the factors that led to the sale of the Radisson. Plus, in today's lifestyle segment, a hotel incorporates a robot into their service industry. And we have Professor Ryan to discuss the gender differences in light of the Women in Leadership Conference. 15 on 15 starts right now. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Yan Tulu. Earlier this year, the decision was made by Carlson Residor Hotel Group to sell the Radisson. Carlson Residor is a global company with multiple thousands of hotels around the world. The hotel group is the developer for the Radisson on the island. Aruba's Radisson is one of the last remaining properties that is owned outright by Carlson Residor. The general manager for the property clarifies that many problems within Aruba's tourism industry factors in on the developer's decision to sell the Radisson. Over the past decade, the tourism district in Nord has grown rapidly. The restaurant developments in the area specifically directly impacts the food and beverage business inside of hotels. Radisson's F&B has not been meeting profit margin due to hotel guests having so many options to dine at. This ultimately affected employee personnel and salary. Outside factors being clearly across the road from us, we have a massive growth of restaurants and bars that affect our internal food and beverage business. We actually see it as a positive on the one hand because it's great to have a location right next to all of these restaurants and bars. The negative is, is that folks that used to work for us five, six years ago when the department was making one or two million dollars a year more, we can't sustain their employment because we don't have the income coming in to sustain it. So we have to look at how do we retain them in our business in some new structure. Or in many cases, if uh, you know we have uh, close to 30 individuals that are already past the retirement age, already drawing a pension, how many of those individuals would like to volunteer to go on retirement um, and to help us with let the younger folk uh, make their way up through the ranks? Another factor that negatively impacts the operation of the Radisson on Aruba is the lack of control on the public beaches. Due to this, Radisson guests have vowed to not return to the hotel. Secondarily, we have a huge amount of pressure being put on us uh, down on the beach. We have vast numbers of our guests saying they're not going to come back again because of the problems on Palm Beach with the vendors, with the drugs that are being pushed down at Boogaloo, uh, down on the pier, uh, the Palapas being overrun. These are huge issues. Uh, piles and piles and piles of paperwork that I have on my desk from customers saying, thanks very much, we're not coming back. This puts pressure on our financial forecasts for the future. And when that puts pressure on our financial forecasts, we have to look to make that money somewhere else for an institutional investor and that comes out of payroll. That's the biggest place to look. So restructuring is inevitable because of the changing face of the business that we run and the changing face of the business world around us. Additionally, since the property isn't generating enough income, the continuous introductions of levies and taxes by the government has become a burden for the hoteliers. The Radisson in particular has been struggling to keep up. We have uh, potential, as you all are very aware, potential new levies and costs coming our way as we try and sustain Aruba in, in its current format, as we try and grow the product of Aruba and make Aruba better to bring more customers in, that's going to be a big burden on all of the hotels, not just Radisson. Um, there's only so much we can squeeze out of our customers. Uh, we have to look to find that money elsewhere. The bidding process for the Radisson property ended on August 6th. On Tuesday night, the GM of the Radisson, Mark Littleton, will tell us the investors and the potential buyers who may take over. In other developments, Aruba Port Authority's moved Barcadera is in full swing. The many, many containers you see situated along LG Smith Boulevard will all be relocated to Barcadera once the move is completed. APA plans on converting this large piece of land to a space where the cruise ship passengers can spend their time in. According to the director of Aruba Port Authority, Jossi Figueroa, the idea is to give the cruise terminal in downtown Orangistad a complete makeover. The goal is to give the day visitors something to do and explore within the area of the terminal, meaning the cruise ship passengers may not even have to leave this new space, which is walking distance from their cruise ship. Now, this development could easily become a conflict for the streetcar and merchants in downtown Orangistad if the cruise ship passengers don't have a reason to leave the terminal. ATV will report back to you once we look further into this. We will be right back. Stay with us.
Welcome back from the break. A hotel in California has added a robot as part of their team. Check it out. Meet Alo. He delivers stuff to the hotel rooms. The things that need to be delivered to a room can be placed on top of his head, and he can carry up to 10 pounds. Just program the room number and presto. The entire hotel is mapped out in the robot system. Alo knows where he is and knows where to go by using special cameras and lasers. It can even avoid obstacles around the hotel. When he arrives at your door, you get a call in your room to go to the door. Once you open the door, Alo will be there waiting for you with what you have asked for. The robot is inspired by R2-D2. The investment, the hotelier admits, is partly entertainment to attract more hotel guests and to create some more hype for the hotel brand itself. And in other lifestyle topics, women get more anxious than men in high-pressure situations. This is a fact, but there are good reasons for it. It might be because risky situations are actually riskier for women than they are for men. When women perform on par with men, their performance is typically perceived as worse and it is more likely to be chalked up to incompetence rather than happenstance. What is more is that failure can reinforce self-doubt, seeing as female leaders are not yet as equally accepted as male leaders. Which brings me to Aruba's Women in Leadership Conference coming up this Friday. I have a one-on-one -on -one with one of the speakers coming right after the break. But first, we'll continue with our lifestyle segment. For all the parents out there who tries to call or text their teenage kid, it can get pretty frustrating because he or she could easily ignore the call or message if they see it is from mom or dad. One parent had enough and created an app that forces the child to call home. All the parent has to do is tap on the app on their own phone, then enter a four-digit password only the parents know and hit lock their kid's phone. It will then shut down the teenager's phone completely. All the teenager will have access to are mom and dad's contacts. They will have to call them to retrieve a special password in order to get their phone up and running again. So ignore no more. That is the name of the app. So if you want to take a look more into it, you can Google that one. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. Female empowerment is set to take center stage this coming Friday. For the third year in a row, Atia, together with CNB and Satar, are hosting a Women in Leadership conference. Michelle Ryan is a professor of social and organizational psychology at a university in the United Kingdom. She specializes in looking at gender differences within the workplace and in leadership. She explains a nice balance is necessary for a successful female boss. I mean, when you talk to women in leadership positions, they often say that they have had to work twice as hard to get there. So there's this real interesting double bind that women sort of go through. So there's this idea about what it means to be a leader. And these are often quite, I guess, stereotypically masculine traits. So you need to be ambitious, you need to be forceful, you need to be aggressive. And these are the things that will make you a good leader. But to be a good woman, you know, to be liked as a woman in those sorts of ways. You've got to be kind, you've got to be good at conversation, you've got to be good with people. And these two things don't always go together. So for a female leader, if they want to be a good leader, they need to be one thing. But if they need to be a good woman, they need to be another. And it's really difficult to do those two things at the same time. The theme for this year's Women in Leadership Conference is breaking the glass ceiling. Professor Michelle Ryan explains the metaphor regarding this and details what attendees can learn from her presentation. So the metaphor of the glass ceiling, it's been around for about 20 years now, almost 25 years actually. And what it is, is the idea that there's this point at which women find it really difficult to rise above. And I think over the last 20 years, that's been increasingly getting higher and higher. You know, we see more and more female CEOs, we see, you know, more and more female politicians. But the idea is that it is still difficult. So the notion of the glass is really that it's fairly transparent, it's subtle. It's not like there's a law that says women can't do this, but there is this this transparent, subtle barrier that makes it difficult to get beyond a certain place. But the idea is that women are, women increasingly are breaking the glass ceiling or shattering it, if you will. The event is organized by Atia, CMB and Satar. Professor Ryan clears up a misconception. Friday's event is not only for women. 
Yeah, I think it's always a thing that women who are in leadership positions are always really interested in coming. I think women who aspire to leadership positions are always really interested in coming. But I think it's really important that anyone that hires women, that works with women, that, you know, that they come as well and they see the barriers that are there, but they also see the brilliant women that are out there in leadership roles as well. Aruba is in the forefront of combating double standards between men and women in the workplace. Yeah, I think certainly having a island-wide um, conference like this is an absolutely good way to start. So it puts it on the forefront of the agenda, it gets everybody in and it gets it talking, gets everyone talking about these sorts of things. So I think in terms of being proactive and, and moving forward with it, I think it's in, in a really good place. The Women in Leadership Conference is scheduled for this Friday, August 22nd at the Renaissance Convention Centre. There will be four speakers in total exploring the topic of female leadership in today's world. The presentations will be given in a dynamic, informative and interactive manner. I, along with Michelle Brooks, will be the moderators for the event, so come join us for a great day. Tickets can only be purchased at Atia, so call 582-7593. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back here on Tuesday night, so we will see you then.